So I'd like to welcome everyone. This is our first in a series of our training workshops. Um, this webinar is really just to introduce everyone to what our programming is and what the benefits of our programming are, just to give you some background information. We won't be doing any actual tutorials when it comes to how to program in R, but we will talk at the end about upcoming events that we're gonna be holding that will be available for you to do that. Now, just so you know, we do have a pretty large crowd today, which is really exciting. Um, I'm gonna be monitoring the chat in front of me, but if I do miss anything, um, please, by all means, let me know. Um, and I'll also make sure um, in the chat to post my email later on in case that you have any questions for me. All right, so again, what are we going to discuss today? So there's really three main things that I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about what is R, um, so just an idea of how it's used. And then if you've ever heard of R before, you've probably also heard of R Studio. And so I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction to that. We're gonna talk about what are the benefits of using R. Two of the biggest ones I'm gonna talk about are cost and reproducibility. And then finally, we're gonna close with as someone who works in public health, what can you do using R? And we're gonna look at some ways that it's being currently used. So my name is Amanda Ellis. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. I'm currently vice chair of the department as well as the director of graduate studies for the master's in biostatistics program. Um, my research is primarily focused on graduate education, specifically how to incorporate workforce readiness needs into our graduate work. And currently um, I do teach an R programming course and I've held several workshops like this that are meant to introduce our programming. Helping me out today, we have Nathaniel Wilson. Um, if you're on the call, I believe you are. Do you wanna unmute and introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, I'll be helping out with this program. I'm the Quality Assurance Program Manager at Kentucky Department for Public Health in the Division of Public Health Protection and Safety. I've been using R since about 2018, and I've seen some of the great benefits that it can bring to public health and bring to our graphing and our analysis procedures. So I'm happy to be here today to help facilitate some of our discussions. Thank you so much. All right, so just to start out, what is R? So R is a programming language and it's used for statistical analysis and data visualization. And it can do a vast number of things all the way from things like simple calculations to maybe finding a mean or a median, all the way up to advanced usage, which include creating applets. And we'll actually see an example of that later on. So again, you can perform a variety of tasks, pretty much anything that you want to do with data, you can do in R. It's free, it's an open source software, which means that anyone can use it and contribute to its development. It's also in terms of getting it on your computer, it's fairly small and so it's really easy to install. So in short, it's a very powerful tool for anyone that works with data and wants to gain insights from data. So how do you use R? If you've ever worked with Excel or SPSS, you're probably used to software where maybe you go up to the top and you click on different buttons and you tell the software to do different things. R is a little bit different. Um, in R, it is a programming language. So you write scripts. And these scripts are essentially text files that tell the computer to do different things. And so what you can see I have on the screen here, this is just an example of a script. And I've kind of highlighted some different things that I'm doing with this script. So I can do things like read in data sets, I can view data sets, I can summarize variables, I can wrangle a data sets, so maybe if I only want to look at particular values of a variable or I need to split it up. There's really limitless things that I can do, but everything that I want to do with data, I'm going to write in this file and ask R to do that. Since R is a programming language and you have to write scripts, it does have a little bit of a steep learning curve to it. And so I think when people first learn R programming, it's very intimidating for this reason. But once you work with it for a little bit and you get used to seeing what these scripts look like, you get comfortable pretty quickly. And eventually you get to the point to where you can read things like this, just like you would any other document. And so this is what the R programming language looks like. Typically, most people work in what is called R Studio. 
And our studio is what's called an IDE. It's an integrated development environment. And essentially what it is, is that's the program where you're gonna go in and actually type those scripts out. You're gonna type out the R programming language. And then it has a series of windows and other functions that help you work more efficiently with the R programming language. And so I've got kind of an example of what our studio looks like here on this screen. And so you'll notice it's broken into four windows. These windows can move around just like any other window on your computer. Um, in the upper left corner, that window is primarily, that's where you're gonna type your text. That's where you're gonna do different stuff. The bottom left-hand window in our studio, that's what's called the console. So whenever we run those lines of code, the output appears down on the console. So for example, if I was working with a variable and I wanted to know the mean value for that variable, I would get that output down below. We have a workspace history. This is where you can see data sets that have been read in, different variables that you're working with. And in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, this is various extra features, including where plots are produced. And so again, just like how our, the actual scripts and the language itself can be really intimidating at first, I find that our studio is also pretty intimidating. You've got four different windows you're looking at. And so it takes a little bit just to acclimate to what the different pieces of our studio are doing. And so for beginning users, again, it's pretty intimidating, but once you get past that initial piece of it, you kind of get used to where everything is and it just becomes second nature working with it. So what are some of the benefits um, to programming in R? So like I said, there is a little bit of a steep learning curve, but if you consider the benefits for R programming, I think it is well worth the time investment. Probably the biggest benefit is cost. Um, it is free. Both R and R Studio are both free. It does not require an expensive license. It's really flexible. There are lots of methods that are included in R that are not included in Excel, SAS, or SPSS. And part of the reason for this is earlier on, I talked about how our programming is open source. And so what happens is everyday people working out there in the field, they can actually write what are called R packages. And as soon as they write those, they become available within R. And so new cutting edge things that are done or used, those are almost immediately available in R. Whereas, you know, in other packages or other languages, it might take a long time for those to become available. There's a large community within our programming. So there's not just like your standard help files. There's actually a whole community that is just about helping each other use R. There are ARD packages. Um, that's kind of what I referenced before. These are special packages that are created to do a variety of different tasks. And so people working in specific sectors can write their own packages. And I'll talk about some that people in public health might use here in just a little bit. And so these packages can really be tailored to perform specific tasks with specific types of data. Um, R is great when it comes to visualization. You can make a wide range of different ways to visualize data from, you know, kind of your, your um, standard static plots like bar plots all the way up to interactive maps. And then I don't have it on here, but I think one of the other real benefits of programming in R is in terms of reproducibility. If I write a script to, you know, do something with data and I want someone else to be able to perform that exact same task, I can share that script with another person and they can run that script on their computer and get the exact same results that I did. So because of that documentation, it makes it much easier to reproduce the data analysis from other people. And it also makes it very transparent what was done with the data as well. So let's talk about some specific um, public health examples and things that have been done with R. So like I said, um, R programming is really nice because it can be used by a variety of different fields. And so some examples of how it's been used in public health. So in terms of epidemiological analysis, there are specific packages that have been created just to do that. And so you can look at things like disease incidents, prevalence rate, outbreak investigation, and disease surveillance. And there are packages like the EpiCalc and surveillance package that provide tools for analyzing and visualizing epilogical data. So people have written specific packages for these types of data. Again, in terms of data visualization, there R is great for creating tables, plots, graphs, you name it, it can do it. 
In terms of statistical modeling, lots of different options there as well. In health service research, it can be used for analyzing and evaluating health service data, such as healthcare utilization, health outcomes, and quality of care. And again, there are packages that can help specifically with that. And then for public health surveillance, very similar. So as you can see, people that work in R will often tailor it to work with the specific types of data that they are interested in. So bear with me, I'm hoping that this video will play. Um, if you can't hear the audio here in just a second, please tell me. I wanted to give you some real examples of how R is being used in public health departments. So this example comes out of West Virginia. So you have, um, like I said, our programming can do lots of different things. It can create all the way from like static plots that are bar plots, all the way up to data visualization tools. And one of the things that people can do with our programming is create something that are called shiny apps. And shiny apps are applications that you can create using our programming, and they are interactive applets that you can share with other people. And so the public health department in West Virginia made one of these apps, and there's this really nice video that I'm getting ready to play here that talks about how they created that app. And again, it's called a shiny app. It's made using our programming and how they were actually able to use that and benefit them. So if you don't hear the audio, please tell me. We're going to go ahead and start. Oops. Let me go back. If this doesn't work, I have a backup. Here we go. You're in the weeds and you're just coding and working in the UI think about this is a life or death situation. When the, the vaccine stuff came around, I knew it's, do we have the right inventory at the right place at the right time? Distribution in West Virginia is managed by the National Guard predominantly. You know, it, it wasn't as efficient as we would like, and we, we were aware of that, but, you know, we were, we're in a pandemic. There's no playbook here. There were a lot of hands in different files. You know, they were working with Excel files. I knew we needed an advanced planning system. And when Major Koss at the ground, he, he shot me a text and he said, hey, we need a tool. It wasn't even a question. Of course we're going to do that. project started with just giving them a more automated process for different groups to submit the data that ultimately gave them the information that they needed to develop their distribution plan. Because in our state, we have five distribution hubs. If you look at a map of West Virginia, you can basically touch four corners of the state and you're going to find a hub and then there's a hub in Charleston. The key priorities were simplicity. Right? I mean, we got to have something where at that hub level, at user level, they just have to log in, key in a number, and hit enter. And we kind of looked at each other and said, we don't have time to build a database. We needed something that was cost effective, but that we could get it up and running quickly. We knew we'd get to a place where they want more visualization. These are government entities. There's not an open to check, but this is taxpayer money. Like, what can do all of that for us? So Shining just became quick and easy solution that came to mind for both of us. We needed to create something that would ingest, had about 10 different people submitting every week and then aggregating that information into an output that would allow them to make strategic decisions. The manual way, at best, we would get to that finished product Sunday night. And, and have to start operations Monday morning. So we're, we're now, ha we have that ready to go by 4 p.m. on Wednesday. The reason we've been able to be successful, I think, is because of this distribution network, knowing where these vaccines are going at any given point. You're gonna run into some problems, right? Where you may not have the right quantities necessarily at the right place. So that does require some 
what we call interhub transfer, so to speak, based on the tool we build, we're able to provide like visibility clear through the supply chain. And so we're seeing real time draining supply from the hubs. In combat, I'm moving fuel, ammunition, medical supplies, uh, maintenance repair parts. And there's this thing called the enemy out there trying to, trying to take you out while you're doing it, right? I've always taken the approach of if you, can, if you can do it in that environment, you can do it in any environment minus the enemy. Sometimes I have to tell myself like, no, it's actually a huge feat that we've accomplished all of this because it just seems like we've all been doing our jobs. The entire principle behind this is build something in an agile manner that you are going to tear down. And the happiest day of this entire thing is going to be when you turn it off. All right, so that is a real example of how our programming has been used in a health department. Now, I do think it is a little misleading because they, they built that Shiny app in six days. I don't think someone who's never seen R before, you know, could build a Shiny app in six days. And that's not very realistic. But if you're used to R programming, you can build Shiny apps that quickly. It is very flexible. But, you know, like I said, there is a fairly steep learning curve when it comes to learning R programming. So you want to take baby steps first, not jump right into um, creating those apps. Now, the next example that we're going to look at is an actual application from here in the state of Kentucky. So, Nathaniel, I'm going to let you take it away on this one. Yeah, absolutely. So, if you're from Kentucky Department for Public Health, this graph probably looks somewhat familiar to you. Um, it's displaying some fake data that we generated, but it's showing what we used to, to count how many variants were occurring. Um, and kind of the percentage of variants breakdown for COVID-19. Um, a lot of us were using an R application for this. And uh, this graph is, uh, well, the really great thing about this is the reproducibility of this and how it can be used for a weekly report. So if we had to report on this every single week, we don't have to go in and make a graph every single week. We can just run an R script a single time, uh, import the new data into that R script, and then it's gonna pop out this, this graph here that you see. Um, with whatever the updated data is going to demonstrate. So it's really great to show some reproducibility and how this can be uh, incorporated into public health applications, tracking a, a COVID variant or different COVID variants across time uh, throughout different time periods. Thank you. All right, so I do want to take some time and pause to ask if you have questions. Um, before I take your questions, though, just to kind of recap, you know, what we've presented here today is just a little bit of background information about R and how R is can be beneficial. You know, two of the biggest things are going to be in terms of cost because it's free, as well as being able to create things that are reproducible, which is, you know, of course, extremely important. Now, if you're interested in learning more about R, and I'll give some more information about here at the end, we are going to be hosting an in-person workshop. And for that in-person workshop, um, we are going to be starting with, you have no knowledge of R programming whatsoever. So we're going to take you all the way from how do you install R to how do you do some basic summaries and create some basic plots. And then from there, we're going to look at more advanced training in R. So I do want to pause here and ask, does anyone have any questions? Um, have you been curious about R? Maybe you have some questions um, that we could answer here today. Yes, I do. And I apologize, it's not showing me who is speaking, but please go ahead. Hello, this is Shamak. I actually had a question, but how do, it is about, like, how do I use R for my, for, for like, I, I cannot type very fast, but, and how do I use R to speed up my process for data analysis, even if I cannot type fast for coding? So um, you don't have to type fast for the coding. Um, so R, what you'll do first is you first type the script and then you run it. So the speed at which you type the script, it won't make a difference in how fast R itself is going to run. So you can be a slower typer and that's perfectly fine when it comes to programming in R. 
oh, okay, that is the thing that I was I was mostly concerned with because I've been using other software such as SAS. Yeah, so similar to SAS, you would write that text file first and then run it. Um, so looking here in the chat, uh, let me answer a couple of these, and then I see that, Douglas, you have a question. Um, R is object-oriented. I saw that one like C++. It is an object-oriented um, orientation. Um, to find the link to download R, you can actually just Google the capital letter R, and it'll be the first one that comes up. Um, you'll see it referenced from what's called CRAN, and you can download it from there. I do recommend if you're going to download R to also download R Studio. Those are two separate things, but again, R Studio is the environment in which you're going to work with R. Oh, thank you. I saw that. Uh, we've already got the link in the chat. I have not done VBA scripting in Excel. Um, my understanding is it's much more flexible and it's more robust in the things that it can do. And there's not a limitation in terms of, so I, if I'm not mistaken, Excel has um, limitation in terms of the size of data that can be read in. R does not have that issue. Um, Douglas? Sure. So Amanda, you may be the right person to answer. So I'm I'm Doug Thurl and I'm a CEC career epidemiology field officer at the Department of Public Health. It's so nice to see so many people on here that I know. Um, but my question is, which I've had this question in my mind ever since R came around and I've never had anyone to talk to about it. How, you know, when you get into the more complex statistical analyses like logistic regression, and conditional logistic regression, you know, multilinear uh, regression and stuff, who, how, how is uh, the programming in R validated? I mean, who? how do we know that the statistics it's running are actually accurate because there are these complex modeling mm -hmm. formulas and stuff that need to be worked into that? So I was just curious about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so two parts to this. So where it's open source, you can actually see any of the source code for all of those packages to if you want to go in and validate it yourself to see how it's running. Um, the other thing would be, I would say, within the R community itself, a lot of those packages are going to be run by a lot of people. And so if there were issues with them, that would come up within the community itself. Now, that is one downside, though, to having something that's open source like R with the ability for people to submit packages all the time. So, for example, if in contrast to SAS, you know, SAS Enterprise, when something is going to be new that's going to be put out, they vet it for years before it actually gets published, whereas that doesn't happen in R. So that is a risk that you run, but it is so commonly used that if there were issues, especially in those types of things that are comp, you know, are used a lot, you would know about it from the community and it would get fixed from the person who um, publishes that package. Because a lot of times what happens, you know, just through, um, well, for reproducibility and other things, um, whenever anything new comes out, you know, people would probably run it in both SAS and R, for example, or SAS or R in another program. And so I haven't seen a whole lot of things where I think, oh, I'm not going to trust what this comes out with. Yeah, I was curious because way, way earlier in my career, so I've used SAS a lot in the past and, and EpiInfo, which was the older uh, version of kind of where we went with RedCap now that does a lot more stuff and a lot better. But but. Um, I actually discovered some anomalies in EpiInfo that even though it'd been used for years, it was it was calculating maximum likelihood estimates in one thing and and, and uh, um, another probability method I can't remember what it was on another thing, but yet it was two things that were related and they were not giving the same answer even though they were projected for the same data and stuff. And then so we compared it in SAS and and stuff, so we were able to look at those kind of things. But I, I was just curious. So it sounds like the same kind of thing happens here. It does. And I'll be honest, I've even caught some stuff like that in SAS as well. I think that kind of comes with data analysis and just always double checking ourselves and doing the, uh, I always call it the sanity check. Do the things I have, the things I'm getting, do they make, you know, do they seem reasonable? So, but you, that is a really good point. And that's always going to be something with open source software. Excuse me. Yes. I have, a, I have another question, but it goes, it's related to my first one. And it is like, when it comes to typing my code slowly, like when it comes to the workplace, is, would that be like a good solution for like when it comes to data analysis for people like me who type slow, but for have to do with work for working for organizations that deal with lots of data? Put a particular to analyze during a set up during a particular time period. So I am 
I'm not sure that I can really answer that. I think that's going to be workplace dependent and based on the workplace expectations. Um, there's not really going to be anything that's specific to R that's going to speed up the actual typing process because the scripts are typed um, just in like a, you can almost think of them as a regular text to document. So there's not going to be anything in terms of the typing that's going to make that faster or slower with our programming. So let's see. So looking here in the chat, if I miss anyone, please let me know. Um, I've got several here I'm going to go back to. Oh, yes. Yeah. So somebody said you need to install R before R Studio. You don't have to, but it is a good idea to do that. Um, there, it, long story short, uh, the pathway that is on your computer, it's easier for our studio to recognize R if R is installed before our studio. And that used to be really true with older versions of our studio. But I think with some of the newer versions, you don't have quite the same issues. Um, I have not worked with Tableau um, very much at all. So I can't really speak to its comparison um, to R. If anyone else on the call would like to chime in on that one, I'd be happy to let them. Um, I think in general, R handles large data sets better than most of the other programs, um, is my understanding. And Janie said in here, um, these are all great questions, and I would echo that sentiment as well. And again, please do stay tuned for that part two of the training series, that if you're interested in just kind of, you know, um, just learning some basics of R programming, we're going to be offering that. Can you create workbooks, present multiple charts within R? Yes, um, will be the answer to that. It's a little bit different than when I sit, when I hear workbooks, I think of um, like in Excel, how you have different workbooks. Um, R is gonna work a little bit different, but the same types of things can be completed. Well, there's a question now, Nate, for here. So Nate, I'm gonna let you chime in this one. Does R install on state computers without administrative rights and does CHF DPH allow R on state computers yet? So Nate, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, I was about to type an answer, but I'll just go ahead and answer here. Um, so R is officially an approved software for the state. Um, you are allowed to install it now. Um, you can install it yourself by going to that webpage that I shared up there uh, in a comment to Vivian. And then you can install R Studio as well. For the R Studio download, I recommend doing the zip folder download and then unzipping that file um, to get the best possible um, download for that. Uh, it should work fine on, on state computers now. Uh, you shouldn't have any trouble downloading that. Excuse me, I actually have a question for him. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> like for, pe for people like me who type slow, when it comes to coding, like how fast do I how fast do I need to type more than 56 words per minute or more to getting the coding business for data analysis in a play in a position like yours? So there's there's no time limit on how quickly or how slowly you type the the con or the the code for this. Um, it can be whatever pace you're comfortable with. Um, and really, it's just a matter of learning the language. And the more comfortable you get with R, the easier it's going to be to type that and learn some of those concepts. So um, it is kind of a coding language, a programming language. So there is a learning curve, like Dr. Ellis mentioned, uh, and it just takes some time to learn what those functions are, how to write them out. Um, but really, it's it's fine to start off slow with those and then kind of work your way through it. And eventually, uh, you would get faster and learn it a little bit quicker. Okay. Because because I ended up had taking ended up taking a programming course in high school and I ended up not succeeding so well and that's why I ended up decided not to do coding but since I ended up taking a so ended up running into coding again because of like coding for programming for the health sciences. And I just want to make sure if I can also use assistive technologies to for my work to do the coding for me. 
assist me yep. in the coding process. Right. And, and Daniel Watkins brings up a really good point in the chat. Once you've typed the code once, you don't have to type it again. It's, it's in there and it's kind of saved and you can run it as many times as you need to after that, um, uh, however repetitively you need to do that. Um, and you can also go back and edit your code anytime you need to. So if there's changes in your, in your program, or if you need to change some of the data, uh, update anything, any of your software, you can, you can easily do those changes in R, um, change your code up as, as needed and kind of revise and, and revisit that. Okay. Thank you. So and I, well, wanna, oh, sorry, we'll take a question here in just a moment, but I do want to stay, uh, recognize that we are at time. And so in order to stay respectful of everyone's time, I really want to say thank you to everyone that was able to attend today. I am going to put my email in the chat. So my email is just amanda.ellis at uky.edu. And so if you have further questions about the training, you know, feel free to reach out to me. There's also a link in the chat as well that will be for our future events. And then everyone that registered for this will receive information about the upcoming training event on May 22nd. So again, I want to say thank you to everyone for participating today. Um, it was great to see such a huge turnout. I'm really excited about this. And hopefully we'll be able to see all of you in the future. If anyone wanted to stay on for a couple, you know, more quick questions, I'm happy to do that. All right, then well, I am going to stop the recording and go ahead and close out the Zoom. So again, thank you to everyone for coming today.